Kelvin Crombie is not a household name here in Canada. In fact, uh, you'll meet him in a moment. It's his first time in Canada. But he's certainly well known in other parts of the world. He has become the uh, historian for CMJ, which is an organization that has been working in Israel now for about 200 years. An organization that's rooted in London, England, but has had a very interesting relationship with Israel uh, now for a couple of centuries. He's written a couple of books. Uh, one of them is called For the Love of Zion, uh, Christian Witness and the Restoration of Israel. The other one's called Restoring Israel, 200 Years of the CMJ Story. Welcome, Calvin. Thank you, Jim. Nice to have an Aussie by way of Israel on the set. Good, it's good to be here in one of the countries of the Commonwealth. <laughs> there you go. Um, I want to talk about the book, of course, but I, I'm, I'm fascinated, first of all, how uh, an Australian uh, ended up in Israel in the first place. Well, it's a story of God's sovereignty, Jim, because I grew up in the outback, or well, the bush, let's say, of uh, Western Australia on a sheep, wheat and, and pig farm. Uh, no Christian background and no Jewish background, but from a very, very young age, I developed an interest in Israel because I had a neighbour who was part of the Australian forces there, known as the Light Horse in the First World War, and they're involved in the capture of the land of Palestine from the Turks. And I had uncles who had been serving as Australian soldiers in the Middle East in the Second World War. Uh, most people are unaware of the fact that most of the garrison forces in Palestine during the Second World War were Australian soldiers. So as a young age, at a young age, I began to develop this interest in the Jewish people and the land of Israel, not from any religious uh, connotations, but from this Australian military and family connection side. And as I got older, the interest continued to grow. I had an encyclopedia set that came out from London on a weekly basis on the Second World War. And I began to get intrigued by the Holocaust, even as a kid of about nine, ten years of age, and had these big question marks in my mind. Well, who were these Jewish people and why were they being killed? Then in 1966, I believe it was, an Israeli family came to live in the same area. Now, this is a very, very remote area of Western Australia. And we never saw foreigners. So suddenly an Israeli family came to live there for two years and I got to know the kids and collected their postage stamps. The Six Day War came along when I was 10 years of age and I used to collect the articles from the newspaper. My father came in once, he'd been an Australian soldier in the Second World War, never spoke about war. And he made a comment after listening to the news. He said something like, well, son, looks like I might be going back fighting or something like that. So all those things gathered together, created in me by the age of 15 an interest in Israel, going to Israel. A school friend once told me that at the age of 15 I told her that I would go to Israel. And I was um, determined to go there, but I was searching at the same time, searching for an answer to life. and uh, didn't think I would find it in Australia. I went to study history at the University of Western Australia, but pulled out after a year and a half. I didn't want to just study things from books. I wanted to go and see the actual places I was interested in. So much to the consternation of my parents, I went back to the farm and saved some money and in 1978 set off overseas, ostensibly to go to Israel. But I travelled through Europe first, I wanted to live life to its fullest because I knew deep down that I would actually find the answer to life in Israel. Now I didn't know what that answer was, but I knew it was in Israel. And I finally got there at the age of 21 in 1979, went to a kibbutz in the northern part of Israel and at that stage, a few contusions were coming over, so most people weren't going there, but being as, you know, who I was, I went up there. And from that time onwards, my love affair with Israel just continued to grow. But at the same time as it began to grow, I also felt this yearning for, to find out what it was that really had pulled me to Israel in the first place, ever since I was a, a young kid. And so at one stage, I really wanted to, to become a part of the community of Israel. See, I could sense there was something dynamic there, something real, which I didn't find in Australia, either on the farm or in the city. But I wanted to be a part of whatever this was in Israel. I listened to the stories of many people who had survived the wars and the Holocaust and whatever else, and I wanted to become a part of that. So I began to consider uh, conversion to Judaism, not for any religious reasons, but just to become an Israeli, serve in the army, and so on and so forth. But halfway through that process, actually I was talking to an English guy who was converting at the same time, and he was telling me, what's involved, reading of the books, studying all the rabbinical stuff, going before the rabbis, then having an operation on a certain part of the, the anatomy, and you know, won't go any further than that. So I suddenly began to realise, hey, this is not an easy, um, straightforward thing. So at that stage I sort of dropped that idea, but then I had nothing to fall back onto. So I still wanted to live in Israel, but there was nothing else taking its place. And in Hebrew, we have a word called dafka, which basically means dafka. It means, you know, at that time, 
a Christian girl came to the kibbutz from California. And I think five minutes after she got there, she began to witness to me about Jesus. And I said, hang on, I, I don't want to hear about this Jesus. It's not for me. I said, if there's a God, he's the God of Israel and the Jewish people, not of this Christianity stuff. I had no interest in Christianity. For me, it was all just a system of, of hypocrisy from what I'd seen from the cathedrals, etc. Um, but nevertheless, I think this girl began to pray. And some months later, in the period of Easter and Passover, which in 1981 fell on the same weekend, I went to Jerusalem with this girl and some other people from the kibbutz and went and saw all the, the Jewish ceremonies of Passover and Easter Friday and so on and so forth. But none of it did anything for me. It didn't touch me at all. It probably actually had a negative effect upon me. But come Easter Sunday morning, we went to a place called the Garden Tomb, uh, which in those days and still today, it's a wonderful place on, on Easter, Friday, uh, Easter Sunday morning. Sorry. And on that occasion, there was an Anglican minister speaking. Now, once I saw an Anglican minister with a dog collar, I thought, oh, that's part of that system I want nothing from. Well, this was quite extraordinary because this Anglican minister came from a church called Christ Church, which is just inside Jaffa Gate, Jerusalem, which I didn't know anything about, and belonged to this organisation called CMJ, which I didn't know anything about. Yet he preached a message which um, turned me upside down. First of all, he said that Jesus was a Jew. Now, I must have heard that at some stage in my life, but it had never registered. What is this? Jesus is a Jew. This was the time in which I believe God actually wanted to meet with me. Jesus was a Jew. Uh, secondly, he said that Jesus was the Passover lamb. Well, six o'clock in the morning is a bit too early for theological things like that. But the point that really got me was his comment that the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel would precede the return of Jesus to Jerusalem. So suddenly my either or theology went out the window. Either it